This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski with Children Come First. As always, we're here with wonderful guests relating to our children. And today we have a very unique guest, someone who I met when I was out west. And he impressed me so much, I've come to hear him several times. His name is Dr. John Hagland. Good morning, Dr. Hagland. Good morning. And he is the uh, presidential running uh, person who's running for president. And the interesting part is that many people haven't heard about uh, Dr. Hagelin because he is running both as a Reform Party candidate and as a Natural Law Party candidate, which means that he's a what we might call a third party candidate. And I want to give him this time because I think it's really important to hear from our third party candidates. And secondly, because there are events that are taking place upcoming that uh, are critical to our time slot right here. And I want to have Dr. Hagelin talk about that as well. Can you give us a little bit of background about yourself, Dr. Hagelin? Yes, I'm a research physicist, a scientist running for office because I believe in the fact that our government should be based more on what works, not what is politically expedient or bought and paid for by special interest groups, but just the most up-to-date and effective solutions to problems, the way we fuel our cities, the way we heal our sick, the way we educate our children. And there are common sense solutions in every field of national life, from education to crime prevention, to sustainable agriculture, to renewable energy, to crime prevention programs and policies that will never see the light of day under Republican or Democratic administrations bought and paid for by special interest groups. Well, we certainly agree with you there. And we know that in Pennsylvania, we'll be having primaries on Tuesday as this is being aired. Uh, and almost half of them are running unopposed, which means that we really don't even have a two-party system, much less talking about three candidates. Uh, we don't even have two-party, which gives us a great many of career politicians in this state, which I am sure you have something to say about. Well, you're right in that our democracy has stagnate, stagnated to such a large degree that many of our races run unopposed. And in fact, a record number of our voters don't even bother to show up to vote, 115 million non-voters in the last election. But to set the stage, people need to remember that a third parties are responsible for the vast majority of everything we cherish in our democracy, the right of women to vote, the abolition of slavery, child labor laws, workers' compensation. These ideas and everything else came from third party movements. They were resisted by the political status quo. And it was only the strength of these third-party movements that brought these common-sense ideas to the fore. So win or lose seats, we will inevitably affect the political dialogue, and we're going to inject into the political debate ideas that are so self-evidently right, like a woman's right to vote, so undeniably true that they are infectious. Once out of the bag, they can never be recalled, and they will inevitably affect our political reality. Now, let's talk about something that's coming up. We're going to start the conversation with this, and we'll end it with it as well. There is a, you are attempting to run for the, as the candidate for the Reform Party. What does that mean, and how can people become involved? Well, the Reform Party, which is still America's largest reform-minded force in America, has been uh, co-opted, or certainly Pat Buchanan is attempting to co-opt the Reform Party, which used to be about common sense democratic reforms like campaign finance reform, fiscal responsibility, government accountability to the people, not special interest groups, things that most Americans support. Well, Pat Buchanan is attempting to hijack that party and use it as a platform for a rather extreme right-wing social agenda. Now I have emerged as his main challenger within the Reform Party and I'm attempting to hijack it back. Every American can vote in this Reform Party presidential primary by requesting a ballot this month in June. That means if you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent or a registered voter of any political party, you can request a ballot and you have been being welcomed to participate in this presidential primary for the Reform Party. To get your ballot, all you'd have to do is go to the website reasontovote.com. That's Reason, www.reasontovote.com. 
dot com and their request a ballot to participate in the primary. It's as easy as that, and it will make a difference. Now, I love that website. Is there also an 800 number that people can call to talk to you? Yes, you can call our my national campaign headquarters at one eight seven seven Hagelin. That's a toll free number eight seven seven H A G E L I N, and request more information about my campaign or about the Natural Law Party, which is uh, the second political party that I'm running for as its presidential nominee. But probably they will mainly direct you if you have access to the internet to this www.reasontovote.site because that not only allows you to find out about my candidacy and my solutions, but it also lets you vote in this crucial Reform Party primary and to stop you, Pat Buchanan from running for president and getting $12.6 million of tax money to promote his right-wing agenda. Now, if I'm a Republican, I don't understand this process, and I'm sure many of our listening audience don't understand the process. If I am a registered Democrat or a registered Republican, can I go on ReasonToVote.com and vote for you? Absolutely, yes. It doesn't matter what your current party affiliation. Every registered voter from any party is welcome to participate in this primary and to vote in this primary. And there will be two choices. Pat Buchanan or myself, and I hope your listeners would vote for me, just go to reasontovote.com and request a ballot. The ballot will be sent to you by mail, and uh, then you'll have uh, a week or two, if you wish, to fill out that ballot, which is very simple, and send it back in. And it's as easy as that. What if I'm not registered to vote? Can I still vote? You'd have to register to vote. That is the only requirement that the Reform Party asks. And really, frankly, everybody should be registered to vote. It only takes a moment. It can be done at the your uh, election office. It can be done quite easily in the different states. Because people who, um, who don't vote often don't realize how crucially important politics is to our lives. They may not realize that every day. Congress is making decisions that affect our education, that affect our food supply or genetic engineering of food, so that affect our health care and whether we have prevention or don't have prevention. So people need to play a role. They need to exercise their democratic rights because if they don't, there are others who are eager to exercise them for us. And those are the special interest groups who basically own the government. Now... Getting off of the mechanics of voting, let's go to why we should opt for you as opposed to Buchanan or Gore or anyone else who's running at this point. Let's talk about issues regarding, you and I talked about this a little bit earlier, we'll start at the prenatal level. What are your stands, uh, uh, what are your uh, interest and policies on the prenatal issues? Well, first and foremost, uh, prenatal care is been sh has been shown to be very, very important for the health and vitality and success of our youth. But right now, prenatal care is considered to be preventative medicine. And because it's preventative medicine, believe it or not, it has been banned by Congress from Medicare, Medicaid, from the VA systems, from all of our federal health care programs. And this is quite an astonishing fact, the banning of prevention. Because Congress's own statistics prove 70% of disease is preventable through prenatal care and simple proven preventative medicine. Well, if most of our disease and $700 billion in annual medical costs are preventable through common sense prevention, why has Congress banned prevention from all of our federal health care programs? It has to do with the fact that there are over 1,000 medical PACs political action committees. These are the money-giving arms of lobbyists. And these PAC contributions bankroll the re-election campaigns of our congressmen. So you have the medical establishment pouring millions of dollars into the re-election campaigns of our congressmen, and thereby perpetuating the medical status quo. Irrespective of our political stripes, we must all agree we've got to pull the rug out from underneath the special interest groups by eliminating PACs and soft money. And then all of a sudden we'll have 535 public servants in Washington, D.C., the House and the Senate, who will start serving the people again in, in, instead of the special interest groups that are currently bankrolling their campaign. 
What are what do you mean by prenatal care? What are we talking about here? Are you going to train parents? Are you talking about uh, health care? What is it that you're speaking about? Teaching them skills? A big component of prenatal proper prenatal care is interestingly enough nutrition. Uh, malnutrition plays a serious debilitating role in child development, and not just in our economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, but across the country. Astonishingly, a lot of the fast foods that we have come to rely on and that our children, our young children, school children tend to love, are almost devoid of nutritional value. Well, that may not be necessarily the end of the world once or twice a week, but when it becomes a staple of our diets and the developing fetus doesn't have the nutrients to draw upon to really develop properly, uh, properly developed nervous system and immune system and so forth, it takes a toll. So interestingly enough, prevention-oriented health education can be as simple as nutritional education, particularly for a young mother, because there the impact affects not just the life of the mother, but very directly the health and vitality of the developing fetus. There's more to prenatal care than just malnutrition. What other kinds of areas would you suggest that need to be directed through uh, the assistance of insurance or uh, federal programs with regard to prenatal care? Do you have any other ideas? Well, the thing is, what I, I have very simple language that is currently making its way to the House and Senate. My legislation is very open-ended. My simple preventative health care legislation would provide federal funding for any preventative health care intervention that is, both, that is proven to be effective and cost-effective. And I'm being particularly open-ended about this because I don't want to politicize health care. The problem is right now there are lobbyists who are working our congressmen who might be from the chiropractic or might be from the acupuncture, might be from the pharmaceutical industries that are plying our congressmen with special interest money. So all the decisions about our health care have therefore been politicized. What I have done in my simple, very simple sweeping legislation, which has support from both Republicans and Democrats, is simply provide funding for all preventative interventions that are effective and cost effective. Then it's up to the medical community and the medical literature what is effective and what is cost effective. And I don't have to politicize that. That's a wonderful uh, position to take. Now, with regard to, so you are definitely let's look at health in general and prevention what other kinds of policies would you are you advocating with regard to your uh, presentation and your platform good well again first and foremost in the area of health care i would shift our disease care system towards a health care system through the incorporation of proven preventative medicine so step one is reimbursement. Right now, for example, if you're on Medicare and you have high blood pressure and are at risk of developing heart disease, you cannot get a $200 reimbursement for a trainer and a treadmill. But if you wait nine months, you can get a $50,000 quintuple coronary bypass operation, which is, of course, penny wise and pound foolish. So number one, provide reimbursement for proven preventative health care, and that way target America's health crisis at its roots, which is poor health. We have among the poorest health of any developed country. Before my legislation, the whole health care debate has been a surface bickering over who will pay for whose disease. So my whole preventive approach transcends that superficial squabbling over resources and, again, identifies the source of America's health crisis, poor health, and focuses on improving the health of the nation. But in addition to shifting from disease care to health care, there are other things we can do to incentivize better health. One is by issuing what are called uh, Medicare vouchers, which would allow people who are on Medicaid or Medicare, frankly, to shop around for the coverage of their choice. That will encourage competition among health care providers, uh, providing higher quality service and more choices, for example, for, for people who want programs that are, have preventative or alternative or complementary medicine. So there are a couple of things we can do on the delivery side, on the financing of health care, that will help, uh, I would say, streamline the shift to the incorporation of uh, towards prevention and towards a health care system as opposed to a disease care system. 
Now, we have in our schools the children who... I know nutritionists, and we've spoken to nutritionists time and time again, who talk about the fact that they know what good nutrition is. However, the schools don't incorporate it. For example, the schools offer lunch programs that dietary, nutritionally, and uh, with respect to the nutrients and vitamins in, found in the foods is literally cooked right out of it. I mean, the food is just so processed that there isn't anything left by the time a child gets it in the, whether it's a breakfast program or whether it's a lunch program. And schools also, also tend to allow students sodas and ice cream and candy and sweets and often allow them to take as many of those as they choose without really promoting this, these prevention issues. How would you deal with those kinds of issues? Well, Dara, you're absolutely right. Firstly, interestingly, research now confirms that malnutrition plays a serious, debilitating role in the success of our students in school, in attention span and academic performance. And again, not just in financially disadvantaged neighborhoods, but even in more affluent neighborhoods because of the appalling quality of school lunches in many cases. So not only do we need to improve the nutritional quality of school lunches for the sake of improving academic performance and the health of our students, but during these developmental years, students are setting the habits that will dictate their dietary practices throughout life. So in other words, whereas the government should actually be promoting a shift towards healthier living, in a sense, the government is promoting unhealthy living by creating the habit among our youth of eating foods that are essentially devoid of nutritional content. You are listening to Children Come First. This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski. You may reach us at 877-PRO-KIDS, that's 877-P-R-O-K-I-D-S, or email us at prokids, P-R-O-K-I-D-S, at rlc.net. We are here with Dr. John Hagelin, and you may reach him at 1-877-TOLL-FREE, 877-HAGELIN, H-A-G-E-L-I-N, that's 877-H-A-G-E-L-I-N, or on the website www.reasontovote.com. That's www.reasontovote.com. I want to get back to the nutritional issues of, around children, and we, those of us who spend a great deal of time investigating nutrition for children and the process of learning, as you said, and what it takes, we have a tremendous diet in America on carbohydrates and sugars, and we know neurologically that that, uh, puts serotonin and other kinds of, it, it sets the body out of balance without getting medical here and technical. The body becomes out of balance when children eat many more carbohydrates and sugars in junk food and the things that they, and this is our quick fix society. How would you educate parents and t in teaching them about nutritional issues with regard to, to uh, their children and the learning process because I would say that most parents that we deal with here and at Earth Heart Foundation do not have a glimpse of understanding of how important nutrition is in a child's diet. Well, I think there's a great place for this in the schools. I think the schools, because the children are young and are still establishing their living patterns and habits, is a great place to provide the sort of information as to what food can and should uh, do for oneself. And these days, of course, there's uh, tremendous and graphic technologies that will reveal, for example, the health of the brain and can show the long-term effects over a number of years of malnutrition from a diet of junk food. Let the students see what their brains may look like after three, four, five years of unhealthy diet, and then let the students choose what sort of a brain they'd like to have. But also, beyond school, the government can do a much better job of promoting prevention. Promoting prevention. They did a pretty good job with... Uh, was promoting reduction of smoking, and that had quite an impact. And in fact, it was tremendously cost-effective when you consider the dollars spent on that advertising campaign and the dollars saved through the costs of smoking-related disease. So similarly, the Surgeon General, my Surgeon General, will join me in my presidential bully pulpit in helping to promote uh, better health habits across the country. But again, the, the uh, whole 
health care system in, the, in our country is unique in that we are the only developed country in which funding for preventative medicine and prevention-oriented health care is excluded by law. That's why we have among the poorest health of any developed country. We're the only country where Congress has actually banned prevention from our government program. So by fixing it at its source, by opening up our services to, to prevention-oriented health education and natural medicines, we can make a huge difference in the health of the country. Let's go back to education. Education is, I would say, the, one of the number one issues being discussed in the presidential candidates at this time. What are your views on education, and how can we upgrade what we have, which is literally a dumbing down of our students? How, how would First you consider? First and foremost, I am an educator. I think I'm the only teacher. I'm a college professor running for the President of the United States. And I would go so far as to say is that education is the source of most of our national problems and ultimately the solution to most of our national problems. Because if you look at America's problems, uh, drug dependency, crime, even pollution, these are human problems born of the underutilization of the human brain. So my whole focus really is an educational focus, strengthening the schools. And I have spent my life scouring the country for what is working in our public and private schools. And I would found a what's called Department of Educational Excellence that would showcase what is working, the most successful programs from across the country, so that parents and teachers and principals from across America could pick and choose from among these remarkably successful programs, what they feel would be most appropriate for their schools, for their neighborhoods. So that is the major thrust of my campaign. Well, we have several of those schools we'd like to show you if you'd like to take a look one of these days when you stop campaigning and uh, after you win the election. Absolutely. Well, I'm looking now. I've spent the last eight years traveling the country. I, again, I am an educator. And anybody who is aware of educational solutions that are working in our public and private schools to improve educational outcomes, spark the creativity and intelligence of our students, um, should bring those programs to my attention. We will publish our platform in the USA Today, as we did in 1996. And the whole purpose is to put together a blueprint for government in the next millennium and start to disseminate what's working in every area, from agriculture to crime prevention to, to education. So people can contact me at reasontovote.com and send me uh, programs that they feel are deserving of research, and we will try to conduct that research and promote what's working throughout the country. That sounds wonderful. We will definitely do that for you. Now, what do you consider excellence in, in, with regard to education? Everyone, first of all, I'd like to ask you what your definition of education is, because I think everyone we have had on the program and the society and culture in general, everyone has a different perception of what education is. Can we, would you define your educational well, the outcome of successful education should be well-balanced and integrated children who are able to uh, succeed in fulfilling their life's aspirations. I have a brain research institute within the Institute of Science and Technology and Public Policy that I founded, and I have been doing foundational research in education and brain development. And frankly, the potential of the human brain is vast. And uh, one of the problems with education today is that information is presented in such a fragmented and piecemeal fashion that uh, students over the course of their educational careers develop the ability to see the parts but lose the broad comprehension required to see the whole and uh, fail to see necessarily how they, they integrate into society, fail to become global citizens, fail in the ability to know how to fulfill their own aspirations while contributing to the health and success of society as a whole. So some of the educational innovations that I have been either spearheading or have simply been collecting are educational innovations that develop a more comprehensive outlook. And you can measure this, by the way, through the integrated functioning, electrical functioning of the brain, whether the two hemispheres are functioning synchronously, whether the front and back of the brain are functioning in concert. 
And, uh, and there are, of course, many ways we can see whether a student is happy and well-adjusted, but you can actually even see this in the functioning of the brain. One of the failures of our whole educational approach, and it is a very fragmented presentation of knowledge, is that we're only developing about 5% of the innate capability of the brain, of the emotions, of the mind and heart, and we can do better, and we must do better. Because whereas 5% may have been enough to survive prior centuries by the skin of our teeth, in this new millennium, the, we, the, we have to better harness our most precious national resource, which is the innate creativity and intelligence of our youth and future leaders. Are you telling us then that you have EEGs for children who uh, you have searched across the country and looked at their electrical impulses of the brain? Absolutely. And beyond EEG, what is called SPECT and PET brain imaging technology, which really provides a much more modern and graphic view of how successfully we're harnessing the brain. And it's not always very impressive. Much of the brain goes underdeveloped and underutilized. And uh, that's particularly true among violent children. And unfortunately, there is an epidemic of violent children uh, in our schools today, and it has to do with a number of things. Firstly, there are historically high levels of stress, psychosocial, socioeconomic stress in some of our neighborhoods. Secondly, nutrition. Thirdly, environmental toxins. And fourthly, the educational curriculum itself, which again uh, tends to present, tends to focus on fragmentation of knowledge rather than the wholeness of knowledge and how that knowledge relates to the life of the student. These things can be fixed. Normally, people use those the uh, tests that you just mentioned, the spec and the tech, with pathological problems. Are you telling us you use this on healthy children then? Yes, absolutely. My research on educational innovations, foundational educational research, has had to look deeply to see what we can do to really spark the, the creativity, the interest of the children, and what the impact of various curriculum innovations are. Um, this isn't, it's not that I would recommend that this become part of our, that the EEG's tests would be part of our education, but if you're interested in foundational educational research as I am, then it's an important tool that we have access to that helps us understand you know, what makes a, a highly orderly, highly coherent, highly balanced, high, happy and productive and creative brain. Have you written a book on this or have you do you have any books published I do have books published. Uh, one mentions some of this research. It's called Manual for a Perfect Government. You can probably get that again at the website, reasontovote.com. I'm writing a book with a leading psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Harold Bloomfield, and also a very much an expert in natural medicine. And that book is called The Cosmos Within. It's a very interesting subject. It has to do with how we can harness the tremendous intelligence that is latent within us and uh, really begin to apply and utilize more of that intelligence in daily life. You have been listening to, you are listening to Children Come First. This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski. We are here today with Dr. John Heglin. He is the Reform Party candidate as well as the Natural Law Party candidate for the Presidency of the United States. You may reach him on his website at www.reasontovote.com. That's www.reasontovote.com. Or you may also reach him at his toll-free number, 877-HAGLIN. That's 877-H-A-G-E-L-I-N, 877-H-A-G-E-L-I-N. If you have any other questions you'd like to talk to us about with regard to our program, Children Come First, you may call Dr. Daria Brzezinski toll-free at 877-PRO-KIDS. That's 877-P-R-O-K-I-D-S. Or you may reach us at our email site at P-R-O-K-I-D-S at R-L-C dot net. That's P-R-O-K-I-D-S at R-L-C dot net. And you can join us on our website, our old website, integratedsystems.org, unfortunately is under construction, so we have www.rlc.net slash prokids. That's www.rlc.net slash prokids. Now, we will take a, a short break to introduce our sponsors. 
and to listen to a little bit about uh, the radio station you're listening to at the current moment. And then we will be returning in our second half hour with Dr. John Heglin, Reform Party candidate and natural law candidate for the presidency of the United States. And we suggest, if you'd like to, to call us or email us if you'd like a copy of this tape or if you'd like information with regard to Dr. Heglin's book, Manual for a Perfect Government. You may go to his website for that information as well. We encourage you to go to www.reasontovote.com and cast your ballot for Dr. Heglin for the... This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski with Children Come First, and we have Dr. John Heglin with us, the Reform Party and Natural Law Party candidate for the Presidency of the United States. Now, we began speaking um, during the break, and you were speaking, I'm sorry, would you continue with the conversation we were having with regard to children? Yes, absolutely. We were talking a little bit about nutrition and the importance of proper nutrition for both prenatal health and also for academic performance in school problem, and the problems of malnutrition. One thing we didn't mention yet is this uh, emerging food technology called genetic engineering, which I am particularly concerned about. Now, I'm a nuclear physicist and therefore not technology shy, but I am scared to death about the genetic manipulation of food. This is a rather radical technology that allows us to take genes, DNA, and genetic traits from viruses and bacteria and insects and humans and splice these characteristics into our food crops. Well, why? Well, consider the flounder, a remarkable fish that can live in sub-freezing water because it has its own natural blood antifreeze protein. Well, now, if we could teach a tomato to produce enough flounder blood, the tomato becomes frost-resistant and hence more profitable. Sounds like a brilliant idea, application of technology, unless you're allergic to fish or your children might be allergic to fish. And all of a sudden, there's a whole new generation of food crops with this transgenic engineering that the FDA's own staff scientists have warned bring the possibility of high concentrations of plant toxicants and can also lead to allergic reactions. And also, of course, now we have corn, just another example of a genetically engineered crop, which has been taught to produce its own built-in pesticides. Not something you can wash off, something built into the corn, which makes the corn so deadly toxic to insects, even, that the finest film of pollen from BT corn, genetically engineered corn, kills the monarch butterfly. But well, what is the impact upon us, and particularly our children, of these genetically engineered foods with concentrations of built-in pesticides? The problem is nobody knows. There is no human safety testing that has ever been performed, and there's no labeling required for these experimental foods. So because there's no labeling, we have been, essentially, we have become the unwitting guinea pigs in a massive biotech experiment, and we no longer have the right know what we're eating, what we're buying, what we're feeding our families. That's why I have introduced legislation in the House and Senate calling for mandatory labeling of genetically engineered foods and soon mandatory safety testing for these experimental foods so that we stop, and our children stop being the guinea pigs in this massive nutritional experiment. Now, we have been spending a lot of time talking about various issues regarding education, and we really haven't touched on the nitty-gritty aspects. For example, the curriculum content. Um, we have a model at EarthHeart Foundation called Integrated Learning Systems, which is a holonomic model of learning and teaches the holes to the holes approach. And we have many schools around the world that have integrated this approach for the last 25 and 30 years. And what we've done is literally taken away core curriculum, the Carnegie units, and come back to a more basic approach to education with tremendous student responsibility and interest and teacher responsibility and interest. In other words, we don't use textbooks as curriculum guides. How would you, and how, what have you found with regard to your research and with regard to how you would design policies 
in education at the Department of Education level to change what is going on, the old machine that is a 300-year-old Cartesian-Newtonian mentality, into something that's more 21st century appropriate? What I think we have to do is we have to showcase the success stories. I've already argued for a, a, a new type of curriculum innovation that would be more comprehensive, more holistic in its nature. But it'd be tough for the federal government to ram these innovations down the throats of the communities and school boards. I would rather have, I would rather showcase these most successful programs and then, uh, and thereby motivate the school boards and the teachers and the family, the, the, the parents, to import those most successful innovations that are working. But there are a couple of other things we have to do to improve the willingness of some of our teachers to innovate. Number one, I would get rid of tenure in the schools. And also, number two, I would raise the profession of teaching to a prestigious and honorable profession with commensurate compensation. You know, for the price of five B-2 bombers, a bomber, by the way, that the Pentagon doesn't even want and is purely an example of pork barrel spending. For the cost of five B-2 bombers in a program of federal matching block grants to the states, we could raise every salary, the salary of every teacher by $10,000. And we could very much increase the competitiveness among teachers and the prestige of the profession of being a teacher. And then we could start to demand more and uh, raise the bar and demand more of our teachers, higher standards, and uh, bring in teachers that are willing to innovate and are willing to learn new curriculum innovations to allow the whole system of education to break out of its current shackles, some of which, frankly, have been promoted by the teachers' union. It sounds to me like, are you friends of the union? Oh, well, obviously, you're an educator. Well, I'm friends of the teachers. I would give my life for the teachers of America, but I wouldn't give a nickel right now for the teachers' union, whom I don't think really reflects the genuine interests of most teachers to teach. They're promoting things like seniority and tenure, and some of these, these uh, well, some of these, these policies are actually standing in the way of effective educational innovation. Well, we have contracts in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers where the contract states that teachers come in and leave with the students and any other time thereafter are paid time and a half. So it makes it a little difficult to require professionalism of our teachers when that exists as part of the contract between teachers and school districts. And exactly I, right. So anyway, instead of that, I would simply reward the teachers for their successful performance in the classroom, for the actual, uh, their effectiveness as teachers, and by increasing teacher salaries and teacher prestige, create more competition among some of our younger people who would, who would perhaps consider moving into teaching as their profession. Now, what happens to the universities who, as you know and I know, take years and years in committee to change and in any way, shape, or form the curriculum that is designed to teach the teachers of tomorrow. I mean, these curriculum are definitely 100 years old in the framework of the core curriculum of the past and are not moving towards as quickly as is needed with the technology and everything else that exists in our marketplace today. The universities aren't moving fast enough as far as teacher training programs. You're right. And one of the things we can do is we can, <laughs> we can increase competition in this, in this one respect within the educational programs. We can add uh, a simple voucher system which will allow parents more freedom where they send their children. They can choose among this public school, that public school, or the other public school, even among private and parochial schools, to inject an element of competition so that... Uh, so that there's going to be more of a motivation for schools to succeed, to produce better outcomes. That's one of the things we can do. If the universities that are training teachers are producing teachers that are failing, then, of course, there's not going to be much demand for that type of program. So this will be a way to incentivize the entire system, including the system for training teachers. But, you know, I would say this. Uh, what I, we just talked about was really a systemic change. It's a way that we change the, the funding for teachers. 
But it's not really mainly an issue of money and education today. There's more money spent on education today, frankly, than there has been in the last 20 years. It's more the substance of education. It's the content, the curriculum innovations of the type you described that need to be showcased, that need to be supported, that need to be implemented. This is exactly true in Pennsylvania, where education is 47th in the nation, and yet the state itself is among the top 10 in the nation for spending in education. Exactly right. And that's true throughout government, like health care. Yes, we've got the most expensive, most lavishly funded health care system in the world, but among the poorest health. So it's not just uh, more spending for more disease care. It's shifting disease care towards health care through the incorporation of proven preventative medicine. And amazingly, if you look at any field of government, like our energy policies, you'll find that our federal policies are 180 degrees backwards. The government is actually subsidizing right now a costly addiction to foreign fossil fuels through what's called corporate welfare. That means manipulating the tax code for the benefit of Congress's favorite corporate sponsors. So in that way, the government actually subsidizes our addiction to foreign oil. Now we're all paying rather dearly for that addiction at the pump today. Whereas in America, we have an abundance of clean, renewable energy resources like wind and solar that are cost competitive even today, especially when you consider the health costs of airborne pollutants, the environmental costs of acid rain, the military costs of keeping that oil pipeline open to the Middle East. If you recognize any of these true costs of polluting fuels, you'll realize immediately how cost-effective renewable energy is. So this is another example of where our federal policies are 180 degrees backwards, and that's due to the long-term influence of special interest control over our government. That's why a third party, the natural law party, or if I win the Reform Party's presidential nomination, the Reform Party is so crucial because campaign finance reform to restore government accountability to the people will never come from the Republicans and Democrats. They don't bite the hand that feeds them. And right now, these incumbents are the vast majority recipients of all this PAC and special interest money. When you receive the Reform Party. Right. And that is up to your listeners. Everyone needs to know, Republican, Democrat, Independent, doesn't matter, any registered voter can vote this month in the Reform Party's presidential primary by simply requesting a ballot by mail. And the way to do that, again, is just visit my website, www.reasontovote.com. Request a ballot and vote. And I'm asking Americans, all Americans, right now, this critical month during this crucial public presidential primary for the Reform Party, what kind of reform do we want in America? Do we want Pat Buchanan-style reform, which I claim is a very exclusive and divisive message, or do we want a more inclusive message and more forward-looking and sustainable prevention-oriented reforms that are overwhelmingly supported by the American people? If people want that type of more life-supporting reform, more forward-looking reform, I invite them to vote for me in this Reform Party primary, help me capture the Reform Party's nomination, and stop Pat Buchanan from hijacking that party and $12.6 million of your tax money. Now, when when is the last day that people can register this vote on reasontovote.com and, and receive their ballot? Is there, a, is there a time limit here? Yes, there is. All of these ballot requests have to be made in June. And to be safe, really, should be made before the last few days in June, because I have to take all these requests and send them by mail to the Reform Party National Headquarters. So preferably by the 26th of June, if people could just drop in, even for a moment, to the website www.reasontovote.com and click a few buttons there, you will receive a ballot and then uh, have an opportunity to actually uh, determine who the Reform Party's presidential candidate will be. I think I need to also explain to people, and you're listening to Children Come First. This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski. We're here with the presidential candidate, Dr. John Hagelin, who's running in the Reform Party and the Natural Law Party. You may reach us at 877-PRO-KIDS, that's 877-P-R-O-K-I-D-S, or you can reach Dr. Hagelin at 877-HAGELIN, H-A-G-E-L-I-N, that's 877 877- H-A-G-E-L-I-N. Again, you can vote on www.reasontovote.com. I'd like to tell our audience also that third-party candidates, because they do not receive political action money, PAC money, 
and they also do not receive, uh, I'm assuming you do not receive money, large sums of uh, income from special interest groups and things of that nature. There's only a certain amount of money, isn't it, that you can receive from uh, That's true. As a presidential candidate, uh, my campaign is limited to contributions of less than $1,000 or up to $1,000. But the good news there is any contribution up to 250 will be matched dollar for dollar by the federal government because I have qualified for what are called federal primary matching funds. That's the only way the government is going to help me in this uh, third-party race, but it is a much appreciated form of help, and it's through that sort of matching fund help that has allowed me to get on the ballot in 50 states. And I should mention, this whole natural law party phenomenon, and the reform party to some degree, is a grassroots phenomenon. It's not a top-down party. We don't have Ross Perot's deep pockets, and nor are there PAC contributions or special interest money to co-opt our campaign. It's all about the people. The whole thing is of, by, and for the people. And that includes, it looks like, for the Natural Law Party, over a thousand candidates running on your ballots for federal, state, and local offices. So when it comes time to voting in November, take a look at who's running in your area. You're going to find some Natural Law Party candidates, some Reform Party candidates there, and check them out. I think you may discover when you hear what they have to say that there's a lot more worth voting for than, you might say, the content-free campaigns of the sanitized Republican and Democratic parties. Now, you won't see them today, Tuesday, but you will see them in the November elections because we're in the primaries right now, and primaries only have Republican and Democrats whom you have to choose uh, as voting, I'm sorry, as running for public office. So let's get to one last issue that we haven't we've only touched upon and that's the environment we speak a lot about the environment here because it's my personal belief and i know it from my schools around the world that the environment is critical we're not just talking about teaching environmental issues as classroom courses but we're talking about it as a way of life Uh, we don't sustainable schools within the air the the air that they breathe, the lighting, the many f- the toxic chemicals that are used, as well as the environment that the children are raised in their family environment, all have an impact on the learning process. And what are your political stands on those issues? Well, I've taken a very strong environmental stance, something, by the way, that Buchanan has virtually nothing to say about. I have, of course, as I've mentioned, supported and drafted written legislation that's currently in the House and the Senate calling for a moratorium on the release of genetically engineered foods into the environment until proven safe. Um, I have done research on blood levels of fat-soluble toxicants like uh, PCBs and DDT, and I've discovered, and others have corroborated, that our blood levels of DDT are still rising even though DDT use in the U.S. has been banned for 25 years. And that has to do more with the import of fruits and vegetables. But these, uh, these environmental toxins have a serious debilitating role on our health, even on the gestation and proper formation of our children during their critical development years, even prenatal years. So there's a, an, an enormous importance of turning back the tide on the destruction of our environment and what that means to the quality of our life. In agriculture, for example, in my home state of Iowa, two-thirds of the farmers want to switch to sustainable farming because two-thirds of our topsoil has been forever lost down the Mississippi due to highly erosive farming practices and high chemical input practices. But the Department of Agriculture and its extension services won't provide the knowledge required to shift to sustainable agriculture because they have become mouthpieces of the agrochemical industry. So in farming, in renewable energy, in genetic engineering, in environmental toxins, I've taken a very, very strong stand. And that's why I think uh, even more than Ralph Nader in his Green Party message, environmentalists who are disappointed with Gore are turning to my campaign and will support me, I hope, strongly in this Reform Party presidential primary that everyone can vote in this month. Now, we've covered 
virtually almost every issue, health, education, environment, prevention that we normally cover on this program. Can you give us a little bit of information on any other issues that you would like to cover that perhaps we haven't discussed? Now, I know you're a quantum physics, physics th excuse me, physicist, but I think the more practical issues of everyday life are probably the kinds of things that people would like to hear you discuss. Are there any other platforms that you have that we have not covered? Well, many, and of course they are available at reasontovote.com. But one is worth mentioning even in these few final minutes, and that is our foreign policy. Uh, we have become the principal target of terrorism in the world, not because we stand up for freedom, but because our government continues to do hateful things in the name of the American people. We depose democratically elected leaders, we support tyrants, and we've become one of the principal exporters of arms in the world. We have armed both sides of virtually every conflict on earth. We come across our own weapons on the battlefield, and we become known as the country that'll provide a rifle to every woman, man, woman, or child who can list one. So we have sown the seeds of enmity throughout the world and have become the principal target of terrorism on Earth. For our own security, forget about Star Wars and missile defense systems. It has recently been proven that they are utterly ineffective. They can't even protect us against North Korea. That's after spending at least $60 billion in their development. Forget about Star Wars. Stop creating enemies throughout the world. Our foreign aid is primarily military aid. I would shift that right away to the export of crucial U.S. know-how in areas like education, environmental technologies, sustainable agriculture, business and entrepreneurism, to allow more countries to stand on their own feet, to become self-sufficient in their food and economically self-sufficient, to contribute to a more prosperous and harmonious family of nations. And we in America would be the first beneficiary of a more peaceful and prosperous family of nations. Now, in the event, this is just in the event, that perhaps you do not make it all the way to the White House, where can we find you after the elections? Are you doing going to be doing anything? I and mean, this is a wonderful platform, and you have wonderful ideas, and I know this is not your first time running for president. Where could we find you after the elections in the event that and what kinds of projects do you have in mind? You can look in two places. Firstly, the Natural Law Party that I helped found eight years ago is not going away. It is growing at an unprecedented rate, and it is here to stay. And uh, so we can look to the Natural Law Party even in future elections. Secondly, I am now establishing a University of World Peace near Washington, D.C., which will be a high-level research and teaching university, the only university in the world dedicated solely to the prevention of of armed conflict and the prevention of crime and violence. There are so many military academies now and graduate war colleges dedicated to advancing the art and science of warfare. We need at least one counterbalancing university in the world that will be dedicated to advancing the art and science of peace. So you can look for, even online today, you can look for Institute of World Peace, which will subsequently called, be called the University of World Peace once the full accreditation has been granted. And you will actually be teaching courses there? Is that what I'm I am the founding president of the University of World Peace, and I have been very fortunate to gather around me for this project some of the greatest peacemakers on earth, like Dr. Robert Mueller, former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, and for the past 20 years, Chancellor of the United Nations University of Peace in Costa Rica, President Alberto Chisano of Mozambique, credited with ending 20 years of civil, civil war in his war-torn country, and other tremendous uh, peace advocates throughout the world will be actually creating a new profession in the world, and that is the profession of professional peacemaker. And the function of that person will be? That person will be equipped with the knowledge and the expertise to mediate conflict, to resolve conflict before it flares up, to dissipate, to diffuse accumulated social stresses and tensions through programs as simple but effective as stress-reducing meditation in war-torn areas that has been used before and has worked spectacularly to, I'd say, change the atmosphere and uh, reduce uh, the outbreak of war and violence. So we'll be using every conceivable method in the book to prevent the outbreak of war because most, think most thinking people realize today in this age of weapons of mass destruction we that we can't afford even one major war. 
So why continue to pour billions of taxpayer dollars into more war colleges to further advance the science of war when we already live in an age of mutually assured destruction, of nuclear overkill? It's very important that we actually begin to uh, focus more on the prevention of war, and that will be uh, my specialty and that of the University of World Peace. And how is that different than mediation? Do you, I'm, I'm a certified mediator, so I'm intrigued. Oh, in the following way. Mediation is very important in terms of structuring a peaceful settlement. Uh, but in an atmosphere of generations of built-up ethnic or religious or racial tensions, in that atmosphere, an act of violence almost always results in a retaliatory act of violence, and you have a situation in which escalation is almost inevitable. If you can diffuse the underlying tensions among people through something as simple as the reduction of societal stress, then an act of violence does not automatically result in, a, in an act of retaliatory violence, and you have a new situation in which the de-escalation of conflict is favored. So by working at the grassroots level, by diffusing societal stress and tensions, and then complementing that with very, very uh, effective conflict mediation and conflict uh, management, that combined uh, method can be very effective at prevention of war, and we've used that very successfully in the past. Sounds like an effective training program for teachers as well, especially those in our urban schools. Exactly. Now, we are last in our last few moments here in our program, and we are with Dr. John Hagland, the candidate for the Reform Party and the Natural Law Party. Dr. Hagland, we have about a few more minutes. Can you sum up for us uh, in about three minutes your policies and anything else that you'd like to convey to the general public? Yes, thank you. I'd love to do that. My candidacy, and in fact the whole Natural Law Party, which consists of hundreds, even thousands of candidates running on the ballot in all 50 states for federal, state, and local office, this whole campaign is about forward-looking, sustainable solutions, solutions that don't violate the laws of nature, like proven preventative health care, like effective crime prevention, like education to develop the full mental potential of our students, like renewable energy and sustainable agriculture. Programs like this that have the overwhelming support of the American people, but will never see the light of day in a Republican or Democratic administration that's bought and paid for by special interest groups. At the moment, I'm trying to jumpstart an already fast-growing Natural Law Party campaign by seeking the Reform Party's presidential nomination as well, forging a powerful coalition of America's third parties, a coalition that can credibly challenge the two-party stranglehold in our political process. To do that, I am debating Pat Buchanan in state after state, trying to take the Reform Party back from his extremist right-wing social agenda and restore that party to Ross Perot's vision, which was a mainstream centrist alternative to the Republicans and the Democrats that was a party of, by, and for the people, not bought and paid for by special interest groups. If I win the Reform Party's presidential nomination... When, this when, month, when? When you win. When I win that Reform Party's presidential nomination this month, that will actually create front-page news that will take my campaign straight through to November. So the final thing I would like to mention is that every Republican or Democrat or Independent, any registered voter of any party can participate in this Reform Party presidential primary this month simply by requesting a ballot and voting. And to request that ballot, to vote for John Hagelin, as opposed to Pat Buchanan, to help me stop him from getting $12.6 million of your tax money to run his campaign, go to the website www.reasontovote.com and request your ballot there. And also at that site, you can learn more about my campaign. You have been listening to Dr. John Hagland of the Reform Party candidate and the Natural Law Party candidate, and you can call him toll-free at 877-HAGELIN. That's 877-H-A-G-E-L-I-N. That's 877-H-A-G-E-L-I-N. Again, his website, www.reasontovote.com. That's www.reasontovote.com. You can reach us here at Children Come First, toll free at 877-PRO-KIDS. That's 877-P-R-O-K-I-D-S. Or email us at prokids, P-R-O-K-I-D-S, at rlc.net. That's prokids at 
rlc.net. And we want to thank Dr. John Hagelin and his very, very busy schedule for joining us today for an entire hour. We thank you so much. Thank you, Dari. That was a wonderful show. Look forward to being with you again. And we look forward to uh, hearing about you throughout into the November elections. And please, if you will, go vote www.reasontovote.com That's www.reasontovote.com We thank you for joining us this week and every week for Children Come First and we will see you again in our next show when we will again have wonderful people talking about children, education and everything that's related to our children. Please give your children a hug for us today and join us again for our next program. Thank you and goodbye.